spoken like a tree expert, you know, uh, the advice that you're giving is so practical and simple. And uh, I can see that you really enjoy what you do because the passion just really comes out uh, and shines through your face. Um, Wendy, the next question I want to ask basically is with the farmers that you've dealt with, you know, um, how have they bounced back through the very harsh climatic conditions that we've experienced, um, you know, late last year and early this year, we've had some... Good evening. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwoko and I am your host every Tuesdays and Thursdays right here on the Private Property Channel. This is the Farming Podcast where we discuss all things farming related, um, exposing you to the industry professionals that are making waves uh, within their respective areas of profession and also exposing you to farmers, getting to learn about their journeys, how they've navigated through very difficult and challenging times within their agricultural businesses, um, uh, connecting you to exporters, importers, giving you insights in terms of how does this industry operate and who do we as farmers rely on and what the what is what work do uh, agri professionals do across the sector we touch a little bit on the economy so there's a couple of things that we really discuss in this podcast and i truly believe that this is a podcast that you should be listening to especially if you want to know more about the sector if you want to connect with farmers connect with agronomists for example and today we have an agronomist show we've mentioned economists quite a number of times onto the show how they provide support to the farmers and today we're going to unpack that in our conversation so if you have any questions comments please feel free to ask um, subscribe to our youtube channel like the different episodes on the podcast and also bring forth your suggestions on what you want to see in the podcast and so today we're joined by wendy mazura who is an agronomist um, at Seedco Limited. We get to find out what is her role within a company and how does she work with farmers. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you so much for having me, Bali. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So like I said, you know, we've had uh, quite a number of conversations in our previous episodes around the important role that uh, agronomy or agronomists provide to uh, farmers. But just tell us about what is it that you do within Seco Limited? Thank you, Mbali. So what happens is um, as an agronomist at Seco Limited, I'm tasked with the role of availing uh, product knowledge to our farmers, you know, making it uh, in such a way that they can understand it, making it in such a way that they can also use it to add value in their farming enterprises. Because now we are taking farming as a formidable business. So we would want to then follow up with technical backup to make sure that our farmers are realizing the much needed value from the seeds that we sell at Sitco. We are mostly a seed mm -hmm. business. So we sell uh, a wide range of seed crops and a wide range of varieties of those specific seed crops. So our farmers would need technical assistance in terms of selection, what they should do. Then on top of that, we also do trainings. We do demonstration plots where we will be also going out to make sure that the team understands and the farmers understand what they need to be doing for them to realize value out of the genetics that they have. Then we also avail extension services, like what we are doing now to make sure that out there, people understand. So we integrate traditional and digital marketing uh, efforts to make sure that uh, at least we are also adapting to what uh, you know COVID has brought, where we cannot meet as regularly as we want, but also just to provide information to our farmers in terms of the farming activities that they should be doing and should be tasked with. Right. So when should a farmer start engaging or having a relationship with an agronomist? Uh, is it before they start planting or during their production cycle? Farmers basically need to change their mindset and they need a mindset shift mm. whereby we need to then um, conscientize them that it starts 
with you acquiring the right skills or the right basic knowledge before you venture into any uh, cropping program. So we wouldn't want a situation whereby the farmer is coming in at a later stage and maybe some mistakes have been made. Some of them, they cannot be rectified. So you would want the farmer to be in a position to engage an agronomist or a technical expert in the field that they want to get into so that they can get the information uh, beforehand in terms of what they need to prepare, what they need to look out for, as well as the profitability. Since we said that farming is a business, so you need to know how profitable is it and you need to understand the markets that are available. So all this can only come if you plan in advance and you do it before you venture into the enterprise. Fantastic. So I'm glad you mentioned all these topics, you know, because yes, farming is a business, right? Um, and we need to take it seriously because we have experts like you who give proper, good, professional advice. So you said planning in advance. Now let's take it into detail. I'm a farmer. Maybe I want to start my new season. So maybe I might, I'm probably a seasoned farmer, right? I just want to start my new season and make sure that whatever challenges that I experienced in the previous season do not occur in the next, next season. Furthermore, I'm also a farmer who maybe just wants to start. At what type of discussions would you be having with these two different farmers? A new entrant and a person that's trying to perfect their season. So maybe give us an insight in terms of the type of conversation you'll have with a farmer that's just starting out versus the type of conversation that you'll be having with a farmer who just wants to perfect his or her season going forward. Okay, so I would basically say that both farmers still need to plan because if you fail to plan, yes. you plan to fail. But I'll start with okay. the seasoned farmer. Yeah, with the seasoned farmer, you're speaking to about someone who has already uh, understood the art of, uh, of farming in terms of the enterprise that they're in. If they are into field crops, maybe they are doing maize, they are doing multiple cropping if irrigation allows. They also understand that uh, uh, the, the times of seasons that they need to come in. But oh, they need to also constantly check on the new trends that might be existing. So in their planning process, they need to engage the agronomist, get recent information in terms of the, the, the trends, the varieties that are available, the new problematic diseases that they are most likely to face. Because we have said that they've been in farming and they've been doing it. They need to understand how they can add on their profitability and also reduce their input costs so that farming also remains a viable business for them. Because if they are going back, it means they've seen value in it. But they need to understand mm. from a planning perspective how they need to manage certain things. There might be an advent of new problematic diseases or insect pests. But if they don't engage the relevant uh, uh, stakeholders to provide this information to them, they might not be in the know and get into their next cropping program, assuming it's the same as the previous one. When we have seen clearly that climate change has really uh, changed a lot of things and uh, mm. no one season is identical to the other. So the season mm. farmer keeps to, needs to check and also plan in advance. After that, the season farmer also needs to do the checklist whereby they are looking at the good agronomic practices that they need to employ, uh, such as the land preparation, the planting time, the management and all sorts. So at least if it's a seasoned farmer, they understand what they need to do and also, they are also going to be doing it uh, timelessly. They just need uh, some refreshers and reminders. But if you are going to be dealing with a, a first-time farmer, you need to mm. drill down the basics and also make sure that they understand that it's not an overnight victory. It's, farming is not uh, one of those uh, professions where you can just get into it and uh, you wake up tomorrow, you're a millionaire. You need to put in the work. And you also need mm. to invest in, uh, in, in uh, the acquisition of, um, of information and technologies that are also going to add value. Mm. So for a first time farmer, they might just hear the neighbor saying, oh, no, I made a lot of money, but there's a lot <laughs> of work that goes into it uh, that our first time farmer needs to understand and appreciate. And in some instances, mm. um, you find that it might take a season or two for you to realize profit. Maybe you're running at a loss, Maybe you are recovering mm. the costs that you have put into the, into the farming venture. So all of this you need to discuss at the beginning. Once you have done so, the first time farmer needs to understand the principle of soil management, whereby we are talking about them understanding what their soil requires and coming in with the correct nutrient management principles for the crop in question. 
Otherwise, you would find that our farmers would just assume that fertilizer is fertilizer. They go on the market, they just buy, they come in, then they don't get the desired result. But the first port of call for a first time farmer, uh, my knowledge is, the, is for them to make sure that they understand and do soil analysis. It's a test that they need mm. to do for them to get custom made nutrient management for their farm. After that, they also get into the good agronomic practices that we were mentioning for the seasoned farmer. But for them, they need to go into greater detail and understand the why, the why I'm doing it. Why am I coming in with this type of land preparation? Why should I also control weeds within the first six to eight weeks? Why is this insect pest a problem? And how can I manage it before it reaches levels where it's going to reduce my yield? So all of these things, they come into play for a first-time farmer. A first-time farmer has more, more work to do. And they need to understand that even when the crop is established and it's looking lush green, it's not the time when they should bring in their friends to just drive around the field and, and not go inside the field to check. Otherwise, some of these problematic diseases in Bali, they start from inside the field and then spread outwards. So if you're just going, you know, taking a drive around the field, you won't really get the feel of what's really happening. So there is a lot that the first time farmer needs to do. They need to invest their time to make sure that they understand the venture. Yeah, like she's spoken like a true expert, you know, uh, the advice that you're giving is so practical and simple. And uh, I can see that you really enjoy what you do because the passion just really comes out uh, and shines through your face. Um, Wendy, the next question I want to ask basically is with the farmers that you've dealt with, you know, um, how have they bounced back? through the very harsh climatic conditions that we've experienced, um, you know, late last year and early this year. We've had some heavy rainfalls in various regions in the country. Um, you know, how have they bounced back, um, uh, uh, you know, just basically keeping their enterprises afloat? Well, that's uh, now changing the mood, eh? You know, it's not a smiling issue. <laughs> Climate change yeah. is really a menace amongst us. At, at the past mm. uh, three to five years, we have seen a lot of unforeseen weather vagaries that have been going on, where you find that in some instances it's a false start to the season, where you think the season has started is October, well, and, in, and it's um, mid-October when the season usually starts. You get rains for three days, then it goes for two weeks, without raining three weeks or a month. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would be a false start. Then you get mm -hmm. a premature termination of the season, mid-season dry spells that prolong, for example, um, in Zim, we had about um, four weeks with no rain in February, mm -hmm. which is not a norm. So some of these changes are also uh, things that have caused and wreaked havoc amongst our farmers in terms of their uh, operation. And yes, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the heavy rains as well, because the misconception that is there in Bali is that climate change is associated with no rain or drought. But climate change just means that the norm, what we are used to, has been shifted or changed a bit. So mm. heavy rains also go into climate change. And the heavy rains that we experienced in South Africa, in Mozambique, the rains that, the persistent rains that we received in Zim, we got persistent rains and a bit of flooding in some instances. So mm. those scenarios, the farmer will not have prepared for because according to the weather forecast which is the main guide that provides information into what the season is going to be like they don't get to see some of these um scenarios in advance maybe they get to see them three to five days before they okay but that means the farmer is already if it's planting planted but then if the rains come in and they are heavy that crop is going to be swept off and if the um, uh, the farmer has already planted their crop and did not do maybe some conservation agriculture principles or water management drainage system uh, management uh, principles, you find that flooding may also okay in the field. So mm. it's difficult to really plan for climate change. The best we can do is to mitigate the effects. How mm -hmm. so? You need to then understand uh, from the guidance that you get from the meteorological services department, which is the one which is uh, which governs and understands the climatic issues that face uh, that are going to be characteristic of that season. If they tell you that you're expecting a normal to above normal rainfall, then the three to five day focus are the regular guides that you need to be uh, uh, partaking in. If you know that uh, maybe your area is prone to flooding, then you come in with contour ridges, 
you come in with um, drainage inside the field so that the water gets to wash off and not uh, flood inside the field. If it's an area that tends to be dry, drier than other areas, then you know that water harvesting is important. You also need to come in with your pot hauling, your tide ridges, different uh, practices that are going to conserve as much moisture as possible, mulching, all those principles need to come in. So I would say we have seen a lot of uh, uh, disgruntlement uh, amongst our farmers, both commercial and communal, where even for the commercial farmer, in some instances, even when they think they want to irrigate, they don't get enough rains to fill their water bodies. So irrigation is also then affected. Then the communal farmer thinks that uh, maybe since I have done, um, I've done my, my CA, my conservation agriculture, uh, there's minimum soil disturbance and all. When the rains come in, they still come in and they flood the field because there's no deep pen uh, percolation of the water into the ground. So it's not easy for our farmers, really, climate change. Mm -hmm. It's not easy for us as well as an industry whereby we are also tasked with availing uh, crops that are also tolerant to some of these challenges that might be faced. Mm. Be it the, the, the prolonged dry spell, you need a, a, a drought tolerant variety that is going to mm. remain maybe at a particular stage for a certain time and then come back and resume growth when the conditions are allowing. And then you also need maybe earliness, a variety that matures earlier so that it escapes the effects of, uh, of climate change by, by maturing before the dry spell uh, commences. So there is mm. a lot that the industry is trying to do to mitigate the effects of climate change, but the farmer needs to also take it upon themselves to make sure that they are also doing some uh, mitigation measures in their own right. Wow, thank you for going very much in depth into that. And uh, you've brought in something that, uh, you know, is quite an ongoing debate in the agri-industry, especially when you talk about um, disease-resistant seeds, um, drought-tolerant uh, seeds, etc. You know, and the ongoing debate here is that, you know, um, there's certain countries and there's certain organizations that have laws and policies around uh, the different types of seeds that are meant to be sold, you know. So the debate is about whether farmers should use GMO seeds, non-GMO seeds, open pollinated seeds, hybrid seeds. What's your opinion around this? And maybe if you could just maybe touch on a little bit based on GMO, non-GMO, hybrid, open pollinated, the difference, the difference between all of these for our audience to understand in depth the different varieties that are out there. So what's your opinion around the use of these various seeds? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, you mentioned mitigating the risks. So when, when, when we are experiencing severe uh, climate, climatic conditions, should we then move, move over to maybe hybrid seeds uh, versus open pollinated? So what's your opinion um, around this topic? And also maybe bring in your experience on what you've seen on the ground. Thank you very much for that uh, question. I would say you have really put me on the spot there, but I'll do my <laughs> best. <laughs> so what happens, you know, with the, the different types of seeds, I'll start with the open pollinated seeds, which also speaks to the land races, particularly looking at um, maize, it being a staple crop in most African countries. You find that there are some land race varieties that have existed for a very long time on the market. And um, they've been a farmer retained it's like the seed that the farmer is going to retain over and over and over again. But uh, initially, it was enough for you to have that seed because that was in the advent of agriculture. And uh, as a technology, it was a good uh, technology for us to have those land race varieties. But mm -hmm. over time, as you know, that agriculture is not constant. It's also dynamic like any other sector. Over time, it was realized that the yields that are obtained from OPVs, open pollinated varieties, or farm saved varieties over years, uh, they, they tend to be lower compared to uh, the need that was arising from the increase in population that was being experienced. So there was a need for us to reach food security and food security then feeds into food uh, surplus for us to then export to our other countries that might still be in need. So as Africa, we have not really mastered the, um, the ability to produce what is enough for ourselves, enough for us to then sell to other countries. So there was a need, a gap there that existed that then prompted breeders to come in with what we are terming hybrid seed. Because with mm. hybrid seed now, you are now getting 
more value out of the same amount of seed that you will have established. For example, in the um, in some um, varieties like Hagrid King, which is also an OPV, or the eight line variety that our farmers do, or the colorful maize that we have seen, you find that the number of rows per, per, per cob tends to be around eight, six to eight. And then the number of uh, uh, the length of the cob as well tends to be shorter. So it tends to produce less grain. When we are talking about farming being a business where you need to push in terms of the grain that you get, which comes from the yield components that, uh, that uh, also include the number of rows of on the plants, the size of the cob, and also the, um, the weight of the grain that you're also going to get. So the hybrid seeds came in and it outweighed the OPV seed in terms of these characteristics. Then we mm. also saw that over time, there was the development of problematic diseases like your gray leaf spot, you find like maize streak virus and all those. So in those land race varieties, OPV varieties, there was not much that could be done to safeguard uh, the grain from, from the challenges that were posed by these new diseases and new strains mm. of diseases that might have been existing before. But with the hybrid seed, you are able to introduce new genes that you are going to say, because of this particular gene, we are now safeguarded against this problem because of this gene. We are now safeguarded against gray leaf spot. So now we have hybrid seed that is resistant, which means it will not be affected by gray leaf spot. It will not be affected by leaf rust. If it's leaf rust, some whatever problematic diseases might exist. So hybrid seeds have resistance and tolerance to problematic diseases that the OPV seed might not have. So, um, uh, you are seeing that the OPV seed so far, it might have lower yields. It might be susceptible to diseases. It might also not be drought tolerant because when it was developed, climate change had, or had started, the climate has been changing for like, it, it, it always changes. But the rate at which it's changing now was not the same as what happened when those varieties were, were availed. Mm. So you find that uh, the hybrid seed is able to withstand long periods of dry spells, challenges that come with climate change, falling mm. in the fields from wind, excess wind or excess rain, more than what the OPV seed will do. Then mm. moving from the, um, uh, from the OPV seed, I think uh, concurrently I've also mentioned what the hybrid seed would also be doing. But yes. uh, just to add on in terms of the hybrid seed, you find that uh, it comes with a wide range of options where you find that um, uh, based on the pharmacy agroecological region, where they are also doing their cropping, there are varieties that mature very early, 90 to 120 days. There are varieties that take 115 days. There will be varieties that take longer in the field, but also giving higher yields, like uh, maybe the late maturing varieties that will give mm. 160 to 100, 150 to 160 days, but giving mm. very high yields. So there are options with hybrid seeds that don't exist with OPV seed. Because with OPV, it's only one seed. This, uh, the, the yield potential is the same. No matter what you do, no matter what you increase, even with soil analysis and the good agronomic practices we were mentioning, you are unable to reach a certain level. There is a, there is a ceiling to what you can do with your OPV, but with hybrids, there are a lot of options. Then moving away from that, uh, so that I don't over explain on this particular question alone, but it's you who put me on the spot. So for <laughs> no GMOs, worries. <laughs> so for GMOs, um, it's an interesting topic really, uh, where there's a lot of misconceptions that exist. One, there mm. is uh, a lack of uh, knowledge uh, amongst our farmers who are the implementers or the people who are supposed to take on the new technology. So um, uh, in some instances, it might appear as if it's bringing in negative side effects uh, to, to, to get into the GMO technology in farming. But uh, sometimes it's because of the ignorance or lack of adequate knowledge on how it works. Because currently you'd find that there are some uh, GMO maize seeds that are available on the market. In Zimbabwe, we have not adopted uh, GMO technology yet. I'll tell you why. But uh, in some countries, the GMO technologies have been uh, adopted. But having been adopted, you find that uh, they come in with a reduction in cost of production where, where a farmer is able to go in because the seed is GMO. They can spray a particular product without the risk of damaging the crop 
and uh, it becomes cheaper for them, increasing then on their bottom line, which is the yield, because profitability is what you are looking for, since farming is also a business. Even at a communal level, farming should be a business. A person should just think of, should not just think of producing enough for them and them, their family. Mm. They should think of producing excess so that they can sell and uh, also make a living out mm. of farming. So this is what we are talking about. So this uh, basically the technology, that was, that's what it does. It allows you to do some things that you maybe were not able to do. If you're going to be applying a, a chemical that was going to uh, also affect the crop, but uh, affecting all the other weeds, like your glyphosate, uh, which is a, a herbicide. If you're going to apply it in GMO maize, you find that uh, you can apply it over the crop without risks. So GMO is a technology that people need to understand, in my opinion. I think mm. it has a, a chance and a place, but we just need to understand how far we can go with it, what we can take and what we can leave. For example, here in Zimbabwe, we, we tried to carry out a bit of a, a survey on one of our farmer uh, interact, interactive uh, sessions or meetings where we, put the, we gave them a questionnaire about GMOs. So the first question was, do you like, uh, do you like GMOs or do you accept them? Then everyone was saying no. Then the next question was, uh, is GMO technology good? And everyone was saying no. Then the third question was saying, what is GMO technology? All the answers that we were getting there were wrong. <laughs> so what it means is people don't understand what they are saying no mm. to. So we really need to just get more information so that uh, more informed decisions can be made. Wow, Wendy, thank you so much for unpacking the, the, the difference between GMO, open pollinated and hybrid. And I think, you know, we should have you back onto the show where you could unpack what GMO technology is, because um, I myself, I'm not vastly experienced in that space. Um, and I, like you said, with this survey, it just shows that even us as farmers have limited knowledge around this and maybe just consumers, because, you know, this is how maybe shops have just been able to um, capitalize on the marketing of versus, around GMO versus non-GMO. But it's important that we understand why we should go for something and why we should go against something, you know, and especially at farm level, how does this impact a farmer on the ground? Because again, all the risk relies on the farmer at the end of the day. However, I wish we had more time, um, you know, to unpack these things and hopefully maybe we could get you back onto the show once again. But thank you so much for also just breaking the, 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 the importance of why we as farmers should have a relationship with an agronomist, a relationship with an individual like yourself to understand the various varieties that can take us through seasons, understanding the geographic locations in which we farm in and the best varieties that will obviously ensure that we meet our yield at the end of the day. But just before I say goodbye to you, Wendy, maybe just give us the top two or three advices that you believe a farmer should like look out for prior to starting their season. Prior to starting the season, what I think uh, our farmers should really uh, take into account is the fact that whatever they are growing, do they have a market for it? Because mm. if you're going to be establishing a crop and don't know the end, the end user or where you're going to be selling it, it means you might end up producing something that you will fail to sell. At one point, there was a farmer who did horticulture and then they heard about Brussels sprouts. You know, they are very small little cabbages for a niche market. And then they mm. had a friend saying, no, I made money with them. Then they went on to establish about half a hectare, only to realize that <laughs> at the local market, people don't understand them. They think they are undergrown cabbages. So you really need to make, to invest in understanding your market. Uh, that's one thing that I want our farmers to understand. Then you also need to understand the principles of farming, which feed into the umbrella term, good agronomic practices. That mm. term has been used extensively, but I think the understanding of which still needs to be unpacked. Where a farmer needs to know from the land preparation, soil management, insect pest management, it goes into that. So it's like a full module that you really need to understand before you start, not to start saying at a later stage, you're starting to see some insect pests in your field. That's when you want to come in with remedial measures. That would be too late. So you need to plan. Planning mm. in advance will ensure security and success. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Wendy, for your time and uh, for your insights more so. Continue to help farmers uh, in your regions, uh, whether it's working within Zimbabwe or South Africa. But trust me, I think this conversation uh, taught a lot of farmers something new, maybe gave them a refresh, of course, you know, because sometimes you do tend to feel that we know everything, we've experienced everything, uh, and therefore, why should I be seeking advice? But thank you so much for your insights. And um, hopefully you can come back onto the show and unpack to us GMO. But yeah, all the best with your week ahead and uh, with the farmers that you're working with. Thank you very much. We are tasked with wheat production. So we really need to <laughs> make sure that everything goes well. Thank you for having me. And thank you for this great initiative. Thank you. That was Wendy Matsura, everybody. Uh, she's an agronomist at Seed Co. Limited, and we spoke about her role as an agronomist, agronomy, uh, the purpose of agronomy, why farmers should work with agronomists, especially from the seed companies where they procure their seeds. I mean, there's so much to learn and unpack and have an understanding in terms of what what white seeds are best, what seeds are best for your uh, for your farm. Are there the right seeds? Are there the right varieties that you should explore in this coming season, in the next? Uh, and she unpacked the importance of planning before, a se before you start a season, whether you're uh, a new ancient farmer or just an experienced farmer continuing with their production. Because every single year, we experience and encounter new pests and diseases. So it's important to make sure that you have the planning from the onset with an agronomist to mitigate against those pests and diseases. And I like what she said about climate change, that climate change has always been there. Climate change does not necessarily mean it's drought or we're experiencing minimal uh, uh, rainfall, but climate change could be extreme weather conditions, could be extreme rainy conditions. It could just be anything that is just changing in the climate within those months, um, something different to what you were previously exposed to. And that is what climate change is. We can't stop it, but obviously we have to protect our farms, our businesses against it and mitigate against those risks. If you have any questions for Wendy, please feel free to comment. We will reach out to her on your behalf to ensure that the questions that um, you have posed are answered and continue to subscribe to, subscribe to our uh, uh, private property channel. Follow the farming podcast playlist. Uh, this is where you could get the interview for Wendy. And yeah, thank you so much for watching the show. Uh, look out for the next episode that we're going to have right here on the farming podcast brought to you by private property. That's it for me. Take care. Mm -hmm.